We're answering your top questions about the Flow 8, and that's coming up next. These videos are made possible through viewer support on Patreon by visiting dcsoundup.com and by sharing the channel with your friends. Every like, subscribe, and share really does help the channel keep going. It's been a few weeks since my Flow 8 first look, and the interest in this little mixer has been absolutely off the charts. There have been a ton of great questions that have come in daily as the video continues to get shared all over the place, so let's jump in and try to answer a few of the most common ones here today. I've been using the Flow 8 on the desktop for a little bit now, so let me know if you have any questions that haven't come up yet or that I don't cover in this video well enough. So I think the most common question that came up is why they didn't include motorized faders and is it a big deal to use it without motorized faders? Now, cost, size, but I think most importantly, power consumption would probably be the reason why they didn't include them in this unit. It might seem really trivial to slap motorized faders into everything these days, but adding five small motors and driving them at the same time during a scene change would probably require a non-trivial amount of power to accomplish. It would be interesting to know if they did any early testing and what it looked like on, on paper after they got it all figured out, but I would have to imagine that it was a considerable challenge to do and still be able to maintain powering the unit with a 5 volt USB power supply. On the desktop, it really hasn't been as noticeable as I expected. Obviously, every other mixer I pretty much use professionally has motorized faders, so I'm used to flipping fader layers and things like that. But what I'm using this mixer for specifically is for routing audio between computers, a Dante network, doing some voiceover stuff like this. So I'm not really hunting around all the time and what I would call actively mixing. If you were actively trying to mix a gig, this would definitely be uh, a hurdle to get over. But if you're just setting things and then going and doing some work and you wanna have some faders to make some quick adjustments, this isn't so bad. Remember, if I wanna make a change for my microphone through the monitor as opposed to the mains, when I flip layers, I only have to align this light to wherever it's supposed to be. And then I can make that adjustment to monitor one and go right back to main. And then again, I do have to line this up to get it back there. So while that is a bit of a slow process, you don't have to do it for every fader every time you need to make a change. It's not like you have to line up all the faders just to adjust your microphone send in the monitor. So it depends on your workflow how that's going to affect you but for what I'm doing with it on the desktop for a mixer in this price range, it's not a terrible chore. Motorized faders would have been nice, but I don't know if it's reasonable yet to expect them at this price. How much would you pay in addition to this price for motorized faders on a mixer like this? It's a question I'd love to hear your answers to, but for me, the lower price is definitely more attractive for what I'm doing with it. The second question that's super popular anytime I cover anything with a mic preamp is what's the maximum gain available on the mic pre? And then the follow up is usually can you use an SM7B without a cloud lifter? And that's going to be something that you're going to deal with on all mixers for the most part. Unless you get into some really high end mic pre's, if you're using an SM7B, you're going to need a lot of gain with those mics no matter what. And though you might get there on paper with just your interface or just a mixer like this, Tracking any mixer in the two to three, four hundred dollar range uh, wide open at the preamp stage to get up to, to level is going to result in more noise than you're probably going to want out of a four hundred dollar microphone. Uh, maybe we can get one to try out here on the channel soon. I've held off on buying an SM7B for a while. I tend to like the RE20 from Electro Voice. Uh, but they've become so popular now that I might need to get one just to be a test mic and just uh, to answer these questions. So let me know down in the comments if you're using an SM7 and if that would be something that you would find valuable for me to add to future videos. 
Another really popular question is where can you find the apps? Is it iOS only? Everybody, oh, it's iOS only. I don't like that. Well, it's not iOS only anymore. At the time of the last video, the Android app had been submitted, but it wasn't through uh, the approval stage yet, but that has happened now. Uh, they definitely have that out. The iOS app has been out. It works. It's been updated and there's been some firmware updates as well. So typical of what you get from Behringer these days, they're doing active updates as they get feedback and and they're putting software out and firmware to make changes along the way. Now, this was a big one. So loads of folks pointed out that the X Air series, the XR12 and the XR18 would be their choice instead of this for the more professional feature set, the better value uh, for features to money and the longer history on the market. Now, I absolutely get why the X-Air series are so popular. They're pretty much popular around the world. You don't hear a whole lot of negativity about them. Again, that value uh, for what you get for the money is remarkable. What lots of folks don't seem to be aware of, though, after we've gotten to talk a little bit, uh, is the price difference here in the United States. Comparing what we pay here, it would be cheaper for me to import one from Toman and pay the extra shipping and fees and duties. Duties. Uh, but Toman isn't nearly as well known here as they are in the rest of the world. And even though they do sell to the states, uh, they don't perform very well in search if you're looking to buy them. So they're really not as cheap here in the United States for the X Air series as they are in Europe and the rest of the world. For an example, at the time of filming, an XR12 uh, sells for close to $400 in North America. $389 is kind of the current trending price, uh, while the Flow 8 is just $229, I think last time I checked pre-order uh, online at the moment. While the x -Air does excel in giving you control from the app, the app is really cool and being more flexible for somebody mixing actively. For a musician on stage, once you're set up and dialed in, physical faders and easily recalled presets from that foot switch are what the flow is designed to do. You could be playing guitar, playing another instrument and reach out pretty easily while playing it and bump up a quick fader in whatever direction. Uh, for the mix that you're concerned about. And that's handy. It's handy if you don't like to look away and have to deal with screens. It's helpful if you're sweaty on a job and you just need to be able to bump something in one direction or another. This is a simple way to get faders right next to a musician or somebody and not have to use that touch interface. If you like the tablet and the touch interface, I get it. Those are awesome. And especially if you're in the rest of the world, the value for the X Air is incredible. But here in North America, it's a little bit of a different story. Uh, we're looking at a pretty good price spread between the Flow 8 and even the X-Air 12. So that's kind of where it sits for us. And unless, again, you decide to import one from Toman, which you absolutely can do. We are an affiliate for Toman on the channel now. So uh, global viewers and anybody else that wants to get uh, stuff from them uh, shipped, please check out the links below. Another popular question is what connector do you need to use to hook this up to an iPad? And for any interface, I tend to use the Apple camera connector, and that allows you to plug in a USB-A as well as continue to power your iPad. Now, this is an iPad mini 4. If you have an iPad Pro or any of the newer stuff, you're going to need probably different adapters, USB-C, and uh, depending on what you're using and what other cables you have on hand. You can use the USB-C to A or Apple's uh, digital AV multi-port adapter if you've got the extra cash and you also occasionally have the need for an HDMI output. There's adapters as well that you'll need for Android. I'm not super familiar with that ecosystem, but uh, absolutely you will be able to get an adapter for it to connect. Anything that'll connect a USB-A up to your Android device will be good to go. Now this is a good one, and that's how does it compare to the Zoom Live Track 8? They look kind of similar, what's the difference? The Zoom does more, it definitely costs more, and it seems to be aimed a little more squarely at the podcasting folks. The big features I've had questions on between the two of them is, does this have the same mix minus functionality that is in the Zoom products? Now that is a really smart feature to include. It seems like most folks are only learning about mix minus routing for the first time recently because of all the live streaming, and having it auto route on demand really helps keep the confusion down. A mix minus is simply giving a monitor feedback or a feed back to the talent that you're receiving audio from with everything included except their own 
input. This can be crucial in avoiding echo, feedback loops, and other annoyances during broadcasts, uh, and it's typically manually routed using an aux send on bigger desks. So depending on where you need to send a mix minus to, the Flow 8 can definitely create two of them using the aux sends. You could absolutely give them a mix minus back uh, just by not assigning their microphone back to the monitor, but giving them the rest of the program. Uh, now, if you need to provide a mix minus back to somebody online and you need to route that back out of the U USB connection. This unit is not able to do that at the moment. You only have the two returns that's program left and right. So whatever's in the program goes back out digitally. It's really smart to have that in some of these uh, units, but not having the auto route doesn't mean you can't create mix minuses. It just means you've got to know where you're sending them and do it physically from the monitor output here on the console. So that's it for the big questions that came in on the first video. If you have any more questions, definitely send them on over. It'll be really interesting as these do start to ship how folks like them and what they run into as features or issues. Check out dcsoundop.com if you haven't been over there in a while. We've had lots of updates, tons of content, and lots more information about the flow over there as well. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.